in uh, 1915, must have been in June. They came and uh, encircled the village at night. And we did not know anything about it, no notice or anything. The Turks, they come and closed the schools. All my teachers disappeared. All our poets, writers, and all famous people was carried away. They never came back. Of course, before that, they took all the, the lawyers and the doctors, they took it away first. By the end of July, the order came out that we had to leave our homes. Turkish people made an announcement, all Armenian, whoever is left in there, it has to be moved from here. There will be no Armenian left in Turkish people. The army is at 80% of the wealth. They had 80% of the business. 90% of the Turks were illiterate. The army has been the merchants. And the entire, you know, city life, uh, commerce was in the hands of Armenians. Now, when they told the Turks, you can kill them, loot everything you can, it was a blessing for them to grab. So we were at our home, and we were having dinner in the basement floor when we heard screaming in the household next door. And the Turks had attacked and were raping the woman there and killing the husband. But you know what my grandfather used to say? If it wasn't for the good Turks, we wouldn't be alive today. They came and warned them, please don't look for anything, just go. And that's what they did. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been saved. They came and knocked on the doors and they said, get whatever you can, go to the church, you know, and hide. The only place of refuge that the Armenians had were churches. So we just left the table. We didn't touch the food at all. We snuck out of the basement window. The Turks had carte blanche to do anything they wanted in the city to arrest, to kill, to rape, to burn. Uh, soon, the whole city was in flames. So they send it to a church, and a priest get up, and he said, my people, we have very bad news for you. They started telling us, they said that, suppose that they're gonna transfer us someplace else. Uh, nothing gonna happen with our home. That's what they told the priest and the board of trustee men. You could lock your door, nothing is gonna happen. When the war is stopped, you're gonna come back. Just take little things wherever you wanna take it. They give us tw not even 24 hours. And then the next thing I knew, was the, uh, we had evacuated. We had to leave our house so they could confiscate all the belongings that we had. So when I saw with my own eyes the Turkish gendarme to come break into all the homes, put them up to the street and march them away, that will always remain with me. When it, the deportation started, they took my father, the Turks, took my father in the army or something, and uh, they killed him. The young were conscripted into the army first, and the elderly people were 
dumped into prisons for various alibis. My uncle and my uncle's sons, they were tied together, they were going to die. They were taking him to kill. All the men they were taken and killed. They took my father away and I held on to his jacket at that time. And I said, my father isn't going anywhere. Where are you taking him? But of course, he had no choice. And they uh, put him in jail. And uh, somebody told me, told us, that you, we saw you, they shot your father. He was running in the forest and they shot him. And they cut his neck. So me and my sister, we went, we got the head, we buried it. My father went and that was the end of it. Then about two or three hours later, they brought all their clothes into the marketplace and sold them at auction. And all the buyers were Turks because there were no Armenians left. And for the first time in centuries, we left our home. Now from our home, we started walking. They brought a, a donkey. They put two canvases on each side of the donkey and they put me in one side. I don't know who they put on the other side. On top of me, they put the little kids. They piled it on me. We started walking. I walk. I don't know how many hours I walk, walk finally. They pushed in a mosque and they converted us to Islamism. They started to say a few prayers in Turkish. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And the next thing I know, my name was changed from Hagop to Khairi, Bakhtiar Oğlu, instead of Bakhtiar Yan. And from there on, we walked. I was walking with my mother, and we saw a gathering in a square. And you know what I saw? Three people hang. I got so scared that I got sick. I got that nerves. When we took, when we took a walk, we would see people hanging by the rope. And we lost my grandfather over there. Within one day, he had a stroke. And from there on, we walked and nothing to eat, nothing to wear, whatever we had on, that's all we had. And that we didn't even have money because they didn't give us time to take any money from the house. We just left whatever we had on. We used to go from one village to the other. There were stopping points. We would stop somewhere and the Turks and the Kurds would come, attack the group and get whatever they could get. And whatever they could get mostly was boys and beautiful girls. My mother used to hide me in clothes so that they would kidnap me. And then one time, gendarmes came, so they were going to just kill everybody. And to any Armenian, gendarmes is always bad news. And one of them took the musket and tried to kill me. I was nine years old. And my mother said, Effendi, that's, he, he's just a boy. He came and he stopped killing me. They have a ditch dug already. They have prepared everything. 
They each got a big hook like this wooden hook. They drag the bodies, drop it in, the, in that ditch out there. They kill everyone. They kill everyone. Yeah. The smell was so heavy that a lot of people got sick. They dropped them all in there and burned them up, all the kids. And then they were looking for us too. My mother ran from me, and I didn't know where she went, it was dark. And one gendarme, he put me down, just like chicken, you know. He put his feet on my legs and my hands, and he was asking me in Turkish, of course, where did that woman go? about my mother. I said, I don't know. Honest to God, I said, I don't know where she went. And my poor mother, she was hearing. And then when I said like this, he had his uh, thing, sword. So I have a scar over here of his sword. So after he went, there was another lady running around. So he left me there. He ran after the other woman. So I went and found my mother again. He. He had a, one young woman, she was uh, pregnant. So he bothered down. The poor girl, she's crying, let me go, let me go. Well, he had something else in his mind. I was standing there, you know, with my mother, you know, and all of a sudden I think he tear the girl's dress cut the stomach and pulled the baby out. Oh, that I never forget. I, I see so many things, but that was the, pull the baby out. Baby scream. Couple ladies, they fainted. Then baby cry. So he chopped the head. So he didn't want to hear it. But the other soldiers, they had the machine gun on us. If anybody move, we're going to kill every one of you. They start shooting each direction. Bullets coming all over. Bullets coming each direction. I'm ducking, you know, I just walk. People falling down, I walk right over. And somebody ordered us to take shelter behind them boulders. Well, after about 10 minutes, there seemed to be no end to it. Fortunately, at that spot there, there's a break in that perpendicular wall on the right side of the valley. And they started climbing that opening there of the valley. Mom says, we haven't got anything to eat. I know. She said, son, we are going to go away from here. We're not going to wait over here. She said, I'm going to go back to some Kurdish people village, see if I can get some bread or cheese or something, you know, for, for uh. And then my brother, he used to find food for us. So I was left alone there with my mother. And then we didn't have nothing, and then there was a barn over there with the horses in there. So my mother went, please give us a place to stay for the evening. So they gave us with the horses, and the horses were eating whatever they were eating. We ate the, whatever they had, we ate with the horses. My mother had the eight-month-old baby. And she said, Arika, hold this baby one minute. And that was her end, and she died. And I don't remember. I started crying. I was seven years old. I never forget that. I stopped my cry. It's impossible to forget all that. These are impressions that hit you so hard. It's impossible for anybody to forget. I took my own mother. We put her on a bed sheet and we took him to, we took her to the uh, 
tudo belo. Pust, pust in. Foot, foot first. But it was an awful sight. Millions and millions of flies at the uh, mouth of the well. Somehow something helped me. I stayed there to see how she would be falling down. As the other part was heavier, down part of it, her head hit once, one side of the uh, stone, and then the other side, and then sank down. Then I ran away. Well, I didn't feel much at the time because in a situation like that, you always think that uh, tomorrow it's your turn. There's no point in, uh, uh, in thinking about it. In... You never forget those experiences. You are not a child anymore. Any child going through a calamity like that is not a child. He is a grown-up person. That experience in itself, it's, it can never be written about, it can never be explained as to what experience that is. Because uh, all the cruelty in the world is concentrated on that person. And you can't, you can't forget it. You can't forget these experiences.